The Elevate 02 podcast is brought to you in part by Frank Crum. Frank Crum is a professional employer organization that partners with businesses to assist with human resources, workers' compensation insurance, risk management, employee benefits, and payroll administration. When you partner with Frank Crum, you are increasing your profits, productivity, saving a ton of time, and reducing your liability and cost. They are unique to the PEO industry because they own their own workers' compensation carrier, Frank Winston Crum Insurance, and they work with difficult industries like construction, roofing, plumbing, electricians, and even some trucking. Visit frankcrum.com and tell them Elevate02 sent you. And if you're an insurance agent or broker, visit frankcrum.com to hear how you can offer Frank Crum's PEO services to your clients. Coming up today in episode 14 of the Elevate 02 podcast, we're doing something we've never done before. Just an interview. This interview is so big and so good, it stands on its own. We're talking with Bill Daly, the deputy commissioner of the NHL. We're talking about the inner workings of the league, how he got started with the league, what the labor negotiations were like when the league was locked out in 2004 and 2005, how the league has grown, and so much more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Bill Daly, Deputy Commissioner of the NHL, that's today on the Elevate 02 Podcast. This is the Elevate 02 Podcast, brought to you by Money Mitch, the podcast bringing you inside the world of hockey. From on the ice to inside the front office, we bring you places you've never been before. Now, here are your hosts, Tori Mitchell, Jonathan Bates, Brian Strait, and Brady Farkas. All right, I want to welcome in a true big wig. Like, we're going right to the league office with this episode. Bill Daly, the Deputy Commissioner of of the NHL is joining us now and the rest of his resume could take up all of our interview time. So we're going to get to it here as we go on throughout. But bottom line is this lawyer, college football player, deputy commissioner of the NHL, Bill Daly. Thanks for being with us. How are you? Uh, I'm great guys. How are you? Thank you for having me. We're, we're, we're very good. We got it. We got a quick layout for you to start. Uh, easy, easy question. There's well, a, it could be Mitch. It could be a tough question. It could be it a tough could. question. <laughs> it could. I got. Uh, you got a little Vermont connection because uh, you got you got two not former catamounts. One former catamount, Jamie Haran, and then Chris Wojcik uh, was our communications guy for for Batesy and myself when we I'm were. So, uh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, but <laughs> we are we're, too. <laughs> we're we're wondering if if those two guys are just your uh, Starbucks orders guys in the morning or treating the uh, the Ivy Leaguer. Uh, are they doing good work around the office or what? Yeah, they they both take care of me. They're uh, <laughs> they're good guys. I have them in my fantasy football uh, league, so they must be good. <laughs> yeah, you can you can be honest. How how often do they screw up your Starbucks order? All right, this is, <laughs> this is a safe zone. Okay, this is a safe zone. <laughs> I'm I'm not complicated. You know, uh, a large dark uh black yeah that's oh, all well, well we'll save we'll save that question then for uh for uh for gary if we get get to chat with him at some point but um <laughs> no uh thank you again for for joining with us um you know our objective here is to share a little bit of insight into life and life and hockey operations um from all different uh different vantage points around the league um so just kind of paint the picture for uh, for our audience what what a, what is a typical day like for bill daly deputy commissioner of the national hockey league and I guess what one of the things I'd, I'd say is uh, what makes the job uh, exciting and, and uh, compelling and engaging to come to work every day is it's, you know, it, each day is different and uh, kind of depends on the time of season and it depends on what's going on. I can tell you that probably over the last three weeks, my, my days have been consumed uh, with calls uh, with the doctors and, and uh, club people and, and COVID and, and uh, our schedule maker um, and uh, building people and the like and, and shuffling uh, our schedule around, which, uh, which is not easy to do. Certainly been a challenging time in the league. That's what you do now. Let me go back to the beginning. You've been with the league now for 25 years. You started on the legal side of things and you were a college football player at Dartmouth, as, as, as uh, I said at the intro. When you started with the league, 
How much did you know about and like hockey? So um, for me, it was it was a great opportunity. I I, uh, I grew up loving the sport. Um, I grew up in northwestern New Jersey. Um, you know, I played hockey. I played rec hockey and I, and I played for a club team in high school. It was not as established it is, as it is now. Uh, actually, hockey is a uh, is a pretty established sport in, in northern New Jersey, and it, and it wasn't so much uh, way back when, when, when I went to high school there. Um, obviously, I was a better football player than I was a hockey player, and that's why I went on uh, and played college football. But, but uh, hockey was uh, always my first love, believe it or not, uh, even though I probably wasn't as good a player. My, uh, my father's company uh, had season tickets to the Rangers, and I became a huge New York Rangers fan, I attended uh, games regularly. And actually, it was a it was a great bonding experience for me and my dad, uh, you know, through middle school and high school, being able to go just he and I uh, to the games and stop in for, for dinner on the way home. And and uh, again, some of my fondest memories of my relationship with my dad is is really hockey. Uh, and my mom's Canadian. And so she uh, she loved the sport as well. Um, she grew up in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan and. Mm -hmm and right around Gordy Howe's time period up there. Um, so, you know, hockey was kind of in my family um, and uh, it was always, you know, a, a passion of mine. So when I got the opportunity to come work for the National Hockey League, particularly in the position uh, I was offered, uh, which was kind of the head legal position at the league, I was only 32 years old. Um, it was a fantastic opportunity and, and I took took that job and and uh as you said I've, I've i've been here now 25 years i was gonna ask is that was that something you were seeking out that um opportunity and that that job title or was it something that just kind of naturally happened so you know i i i talked to a lot of um kind of people who want to get into the sports industry on a regular basis and and try to you know they they always want to understand you know how you go about doing that and it's a, a difficult industry to break into there's no doubt about that there's there's a whole lot more demand than there is supply in terms of jobs um, I uh, went to law school uh, wanting to work in the sports industry uh, it was it was more broad then um, I would have uh, been happy to consider a number of different opportunities I uh, went to work for a law firm. I was fortunate enough to work for a law firm in an area of, of the law um, that lent itself to professional sports. I, I, uh, I was an antitrust litigator uh, with a labor law uh, kind of background. And at the time, which was the 1990s, uh, most of the collective bargaining agreements in professional sports were being uh, negotiated really through antitrust litigation uh, in the courts in the United States. Um, uh, and, uh, so I was able to, to work in sports, uh, when I worked for a private law firm, um, did work for the national football league and the national basketball association and, and the NHL as well, um, in and around the, the 94, 95 time period. Um, and, you know, through that exposure, uh, you know, I, but my name was, you know, on, on a list to be considered. Um, I got a, a number of opportunities offered to me uh, during you know my first five six years as an associate at this law firm. I loved what I was doing there, um, and uh, I didn't pursue any. This this job came along. Jeff Pash is my predecessor here. He was the first general counsel under Gary Bettman. Um, he uh, he left to take a job at the National Football League, where he still works today, um, and. You know, I was lucky enough to get an opportunity to be interviewed for for his position, and and it was offered to me, and uh, I jumped at it. We we have so many good questions to ask you, um, but from from experience on my end, I guess I'll I'll shift the uh, the interview a little bit to the growth of hockey overseas, which I know you're you're a big part of. I was part of. I, I don't know if it was maybe the third or fourth time we uh, the NHL went over for those series to start the season. Uh, it was San Jose against Columbus in, I guess it would have been 2000, 2010, 2011, I guess, in Stockholm. And it, what a great experience that was. I know I know uh, Batesy and, and Brady have a bunch of questions on this, but 
just touch a little bit on that growth and your position and, and what you do to help with that uh, as far as the growth overseas with with the NHL and hockey and getting exposure over there. My experience was so incredible. Um, so I, I love that uh, you guys started that when you did. And um, just touch on that a little bit, please. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, our international involvement has uh, really evolved over the time I've been at the National Hockey League. Um, you know, we uh, started with playing kind of preseason games um, over in Europe um, a as a way to just expand the footprint um, to, to bring yeah. hockey at its highest level to, to the European countries. Uh, we have a longstanding relationship uh, with most of the federations in Europe uh, through our player transfer agreement, which goes back actually predates me. Um, the initial one we signed, I think was in 1994. Um, that develops kind of a baseline relationship with those federations uh, that we then can take advantage of from a from a business standpoint. Um, we we grew that participation at, at, at some point in time, you know, just having the preseason games, the, the, the European fan base really wanted more. Um, the federations, so, the federations you're talking about, like the KHL, the Swiss League, the are you talking those leagues? So there's basically three levels of, of hockey or three levels of organization of hockey in, in Europe. One is a federation, which is like a governing body for the sport in a country. OK, um, so that would be the, the Swedish Association or the Finnish Association, et cetera, et cetera. Then below that, you have the professional leagues. Um, so the Swedish Hockey League or, or La Liga is, is the Finnish Hockey League and there's yeah. the Swiss League. And then there are the clubs and the clubs more recently have become very, very powerful in European hockey. And so it's actually a, it's, it's a tricky uh, landscape to kind of navigate in terms of who you're talking to and who you're dealing with, uh, who you have to make your deals with. Um, one of the things that separates hockey from other professional sports is that we have this existing professional hockey infrastructure in Europe that that uh, you know we have to be we have to be mindful of um, when we're putting games in. We have to mm -hmm. we have to do it in kind of cooperation with them. Um, they uh, they have historically been a little bit suspect about what our intentions are in Europe and whether we're coming over there to you know put mm -hmm. our big big boots down uh, yeah, yeah. and and uh, take over hockey in their countries. And that's not what we uh, have wanted to do. So we've tried to be far more cooperative um, and kind of work with the, the, those European federations, because quite frankly, they're they're very important to, to hockey here in North America and the ability to generate uh, elite level hockey players uh, who who can come and play in the National Hockey League, which, you know, is the premier professional hockey league in the world. So there's a balance. Uh, and a balancing act we have to uh, perform on a regular basis as we interact with uh, those European entities. Bill, Bill, just to follow up on that, what is what is your measure of success or what's kind of the the, the baseline of success? Um, obviously, growth of the game, we see that in the National Hockey League uh, from a European standpoint. So many Swedish-born players, so many Finnish-born players, um, Slovakia, uh, Czech Republic, et cetera, et cetera. But we're now seeing growth over in the Asian markets. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, a few years ago, I remember, I, I believe it when, when I was with Vancouver, we played a few games to start the season against LA in Asia. Um, what what is what is the measure of success? Is it strictly dollars and cents? Is it is it just growth? Um, you know, TV streaming revenues? What, what how do you measure success in that type of market? Well, I, I think it's a combination of things. I think you hit on uh, virtually all of them. Um, you know, obviously, um, creating a, a situation where those countries and, and new countries as well, the countries new to hockey, can uh, produce elite level hockey players who can come play in the National Hockey League. That's certainly uh, a, a goal and an objective and one I think we've, we've kind of accomplished over, over the long term. Uh, kind of a more longer term goal is to kind of build the relevance of uh, hockey at, at the highest level in, you know, around the world and, and turn that into a business that's profitable uh, for us, for the players um, and, and the like. And that's a much longer term goal and objective. And, and it does involve kind of commitment and uh, commitment of resources, but also uh, a time commitment uh, in terms of doing the right things over a, a period of time 
um, building those relationships, um, building the connectivity to the European fan base. You know, technology plays a role in that, and our ability to to um, our or or our Europeans fans' ability to consume our game and watch it you know, digitally, um, or you know, um, linearly uh, on on television in Europe. Um, those are all important kind of steps in 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 making our mark and growing our business uh, worldwide. Bill, you talk about the growth of the game in Europe, but you were also instrumental in getting European players over here to play in the NHL on a regular basis. You know, I know in baseball, when you talk about Japanese players, there's the posting fee that the American team has to give to the Japanese team in order to get a player to come over here. What are the what are the processes that you helped negotiate back in the day to help get European players over here with more regularity? Yeah, so you know that has also evolved over the years, but um, basically we used to have um, kind of a, a, a master agreement uh, with the, the International Ice Hockey Federation that all the federations kind of uh, subscribe to, um, and that agreement um, uh, caused us to pay a certain amount of money every year, um, in return for which we had the right to sign players who were under contract to their European leagues. Um, and so it was, it was really a broad transfer agreement as opposed to kind of individual transfer negotiations that go on in some of the other leagues. Um, that has, again, developed, you know, evolved over the years so that now we have individual agreements with, with each country. Um, they are based on a, a master uh, frame work uh, with minor modifications uh, between the countries. But again, our goal really is more about um, uh, spending and investing in hockey development where we need to, uh, to develop players. Um, and so we, we almost view what we pay in transfer fees really to be a player development fee, right? It's, it's our ability to kind of seed um, the elite hockey marketplace uh, with enough funding to, to be able to continue to develop players on a regular basis. And I think that's been successful, uh, obviously, for, for us and for our clubs and, and for the players long term. I'm going to jump back in, just kind of circling back to one of the, the, the components that you mentioned earlier on in our discussion, Bill. Um, you know, nobody wants to talk about the dreaded C word COVID, but, um, you, you know, the impact that it's having right now on the schedule is is immense um you know can you walk us through how you, how you deal with that i mean who are you talking to regularly is it alternate is it you know is it alternate governors is it building um uh, you know gms like who are making these decisions on how to you know kind of finish the jigsaw puzzle so to speak <laughs> So it's gotten a lot more complicated. I mean, look, we've been dealing with it for two years now, and there's different stages, obviously, uh, of of the pandemic. Um, and coming into this year, uh, you know, we were hopeful that we were past the worst of it and that uh, we wouldn't have material disruptions in our season. Um, you know, we had agreed with the Players Association, um, you know, in the summer of 2020, that we'd be supportive of efforts to participate in the Olympics and and um, we actually went to great lengths to 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 try to facilitate that happening. Uh, I would tell you that it was about a month ago uh, we were at our board meetings in in Florida. Uh, I think it was the ninth and tenth of December, um, and you know COVID wasn't uh, raging uh, mm -hmm. like it currently is at the time. And and you know certainly at that point in time we had every expectation. Um, that the the season would continue to take its course, that we might have kind of minor schedule disruptions that we would deal with and and uh, accommodate. Um, but you know, soon after we left Florida, the the world changed. Omicron became uh, kind of important and relevant in North America and around the world. Um, yeah. And our you know COVID rates spiked again. Um, you know, the good news of Omicron is is it's a much milder form. Um, of illness than than the COVID we were dealing with uh, over the summer with with the Delta variant, but even last year, uh, kind of with the original uh, form of COVID, um, this one you know most of our players being world class athletes, um, you know it's it, they're either asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic, so um, they're not getting seriously ill uh, from COVID, but in fact they are positive and very contagious with COVID. So you still have to 
you still have to test for it. You still have to isolate for it. Um, and you know, the, the levels we've started to hit, I think we're, uh, I looked at the latest number this morning. I think we're at 455 of our players, uh, have tested positive for COVID this year. So that's about half our player base, um, which there's good news and bad news to that. Obviously the bad news is the disruption that that's caused. Uh, sure. the good news is that we're, you know, we're basically, <laughs> we're, we're getting through the player population. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, where COVID probably shouldn't be a factor for those, you know, that half of the player base going forward, um, uh, you know, for the balance of the season. So, um, you know, it's it's something we're working through. It's as, as I said, as you indicated, it's it's caused a material disruption to our uh, to our schedule. Uh, we had to announce, uh, I guess, on the 23rd of December that. Um, uh, we weren't participating in the Olympics. We're now using that those three weeks in February uh, as the time period in which we're rescheduling the games that we're having to postpone. Um, and Here we, we are talking have, about COVID again. Eh? Yeah, we, we don't have much uh, <laughs> runway left, but uh, we we still have some, and that we're trying to make it work. What um. It's, Sorry, oh, go sorry, ahead. Go ahead. No, no yeah, I, I, I just wanted to. Sorry, I just wanted to ask more about the the scheduling. Like, what does that look like for you guys going forward? I mean, this is um, probably something you don't typically. Uh, I don't know if the NHL has ever dealt with anything like this, where you have to postpone games and schedule them quickly like this. Like, how do you guys overcome this? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, last year we were fortunate because we built in um, extra time at the end of the season to 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 be able to reschedule games, kind of anticipating uh, that we might have some scheduling um, disruption. Th this year, um, I, I guess we've gotten fortunate for a different reason, right? We we mm -hmm. were fully expected to be participating in in Beijing or having our players participate in Beijing, um, and that was going to take a. a a chunk of time, a chunk of our schedule in February. So instead of participating in Beijing, we now have three weeks made available to us that we didn't have before. Um, and, you know, we're going to utilize all that time to kind of reschedule the games we need to reschedule. Um, it is, you know, it, it certainly um, is not without controversy in terms of dealing with our clubs and when when we uh, decide to postpone versus when we don't decide to postpone and what's the magic number of players who have to be on the COVID list versus, um, you know, what, what road trips look like and when you can fit in the games. And so we're doing the best we can. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that takes up a big part of my day every day, yeah. uh, figuring out uh, the jigsaw puzzle, putting the schedule back together and, and, and when to when to postpone and when not to postpone and it's it's been made even more difficult with what's going on in Canada and the attendance restrictions we're seeing up there uh, yeah. in all seven of our markets currently which uh, will have a huge effect on our overall league-wide revenue this year so uh, it's a very complicated puzzle but we're <laughs> we're working through it those those must be real fun conversations to oh, have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, not. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it is. It is. Despite the pandemic, it is still remarkable to see the growth of the game. So I'll kind of shift uh, my next question toward that uh, expansion. Maybe this is a, a better question for Gary, but I know you talk to him every day, so. Uh, as far as growth, uh, expansion, you know, the Las Vegas doing so well, Seattle starting off incredibly well. You guys always looking to grow the game potentially to new markets. Uh, you don't have to give us any specific cities, but uh, just touch on the growth of the game. The health of the game, despite the health problems of, of COVID creating. Uh, <laughs> Unintended. Unintended, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> just just, just yeah, touch on I mean, that a little bit, please. When I look at the health of the game, and particularly over my 25 years at the league, you know, I'd say we've come uh, a long way. You know, Gary yeah. started, I think, three or four years before I did. So he's been here almost 30 years. I think he's 29 now. Um, and kudos to him in terms of, of what, you know, the, what he's put in place to help grow the game. Um, but I can tell you that, you know, in the first 10, 15 years I was here, um, you know, there our our ownership was not nearly as strong as it is currently right and we we had uh, we had issues and and fires to put out and and balls to juggle uh over time uh to to get the right ownership in here and and uh, what i would say now is that you know the ownership we have in this league has never been stronger 
Uh, it's very, very stable. Um, and, you know, when we're talking about expansion, you know, I use expansion as the prime example of that, right? I, I think when I joined the league, um, soon after I joined the league, we, we decided to expand by four franchises. I think we got $80 million for the, each of those four franchises. And that was an easy decision for our existing owners to make, but not, not because necessarily they thought it was good uh, for the overall prospects of the league, but because they, uh, they got their share of, of that 80 million times four. And, and that was like, that was important money for them yeah. uh, sure. to get their hands on. And, uh, you know, particularly in some of our markets, when it came time to expand uh, and we expanded to Las Vegas and Seattle, uh, at much higher prices, obviously, um, 500 million, I think, in in Vegas and 650 million in Seattle. Um, you know, it, it it was actually a tough decision for our current owners um, because they they looked at the equation as is this going to make the league stronger as a whole, um, uh, as a as an enterprise uh, by expanding. Um, and is it worth my while to do that? They, they took a much longer term view of their investment in mm -hmm. the National Hockey League in making those decisions. Um, ultimately, I think they made the right ones, obviously. I think, uh, I think that both the expansions in Las Vegas and Seattle have been enormously successful and have been yeah. great for the overall enterprise value of the league. But the way our owners viewed expansion uh, most recently versus where, when they did when I first joined the league is like night and day. Bill, I want to go back to your labor background. Um, lockout is the buzzword of the times right now because of what's happening in Major League Baseball. But you were involved in the labor negotiations back in the 0405 lockout, and I believe you were the lead lawyer for the league in that. So without getting into the issues at hand, because we can read about those anywhere, just kind of take us through the process of negotiating in a situation like that, just what is it like? Are you talking daily to player rep, you know, to the players union? Are you talking weekly? What's it like? Well, I, I guess I've, I've been involved in a number of labor negotiations over my time at the league. I, you know, I've, I've handled all the player negotiations, but I also uh, administer our collective bargaining relationship with the officials. Um, so, you know, there, each one is different. I, I cannot, obviously tell you the 0405 was very unique for a host of reasons and um, it became uh, it was a very philosophical uh, uh, difference of opinion as between us and the players association at the time and it all came down uh, to cost certainty and kind of the economic system under which uh, we paid our players um, you know, formerly the, there was no uh, relationship between the revenues the sport was generating and the and and what we paid out in salaries, and you know the o four o five negotiation was really about whether we could change that equation and and make there uh, a direct relationship between the revenues we generate as a business and and what we pay uh, the players uh, as part of that business and. Um, uh, you know, there were strong wills on both sides of the table. Uh, it took a long time uh, to resolve. Obviously, we, we lost a whole season and only professional sports league uh, in history to lose a full season due to a, a work stoppage. Um, but we, we came back strong. And I think at the end of the day, and I, I, I believe the Players Association would agree with uh, me when I say that I think it, it's the best thing that's ever happened to our sport. Uh, it's helped uh, create a system that allowed for the growth uh, of the game the way it has grown. Um, and, and you know, I think has really fueled kind of where we are today. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're more aligned with the players today than we've ever been mm -hmm. in terms of sharing the, the objective of maximizing revenue because it's good both for the owners and, and for the players. So um, it took us a long time to get to the finish line in that one. Um, we, we missed time that I wish we hadn't missed. Um, but, uh, but ultimately what we ended up negotiating with them, uh, was good for the sport. We, we're going to get you out of here in just a second, Bill. Again, appreciate your time. Last question for me is, um, is real simple, really. What piece of advice would you give a young, young kid looking to break into professional sports? As you said, it's, it's high demand, um, low supply, um, you know, a lot of people are, are always interested in getting into the game. You know, Tori, Brian, and I get questions all the time. How'd you get into scouting? How, you know, what, whatever it is. So what, what piece of advice would you give a young person looking to, uh, to break into professional sports? 
Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not really great advice other than you, you want to be in the right place at the right time. Um, and sure. you can't always control that. Um, but you can you can put yourself in a position where it's more likely to happen than not. Um, and that that's that that goes to networking, that goes to building relationships, that goes to um, learning, uh, you know, s certain things that you need to have to be successful in the sports industry um and you know getting the right schooling to do that um so there's there's a variety of things that can assist you but ultimately um you know it it it, it comes down and 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 working hard obviously uh, but it comes down to being fortunate well bill i want you to be honest on this we'll get you out of here we do appreciate your time uh you are a great lawyer you're smarter than all of us combined i feel like you're <laughs> going to win a debate in any room that you're in but if you and the missus are in a disagreement on Friday night about where to go to dinner, she's winning that debate, isn't she? A hundred percent of the time. <laughs> there's, there's no doubt about that. But that's so, probably true for all of us. Yes. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. It happened Even last the night at the Bates household. It happened last night at the Bates household. I mean, yeah. I, 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 there's something to be said for being smart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My Even the best. Me. My Even father told me, Bill, the, uh, I was going to say, my father told me the day I got married, the two two most important words you can know right now are yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Exactly well, Bill, right. Uh, we'd love to we'd love to do this in person when uh, when this pandemic ends, uh, hopefully soon. Uh, be, you're great to, for your time and we'd love to have you uh, in person one day. It'd be fun. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. I hope uh, everybody has a Happy New Year, and we'll uh, help, help us get through the season. We'll, we'll uh, so, sooner or later, this will be behind us, and uh, it'll all yep. be green pastures ahead. That's, That's right. right, without a doubt. Right. The Elevate O2 podcast is brought to you in part by Parkview Air Medical. Parkview Air Medical provides professional medical escorts consisting of fully certified ACLS trained paramedics, registered nurses, and physicians. These escorts accompany your patient, your family member, your friends on major commercial airlines. These transports can also be done via train and cruise ships for those who can't fly. They will assist you in making sure that the journey is safe and stress-free. They'll coordinate the transportation needs to and from the airport along with wheelchair, seat-to-seat -seat transfers, and baggage assistance. They will ensure a smooth bedside-to-bedside -bedside transition. You can learn more about Parkview Air Medical online at parkviewairmedical.com. They've got a huge medical staff pool. They're able to meet those last-minute requests, and they can have an escort with you or your patient or family member in just a matter of hours, and they have access to visa procurement services also. It's Parkview Air Medical online at parkviewairmedical.com. All right. Wow. What an interview with Bill Daly, the Deputy Commissioner of the NHL. That was cool. It was great. We learned a lot and uh, we're going to have a ton to react to when we get into episode number 15 next week. So for Money Mitch, for Batesy, for Strader, I'm Farky, Lord Farquad, whatever. He was Bill Daly. We'll see you in episode number 15, everybody. Mitch, boom. <laughs> This is the Elevate 02 Podcast, brought to you by Money Mitch, the podcast bringing you inside the world of hockey. From on the ice to inside the front office, we bring you places you've never been before.